So, we're going to look at polytropes today. Have you heard of them? No? Okay, so these are the equations of static equilibrium as I've seen before. So is there a way that we can ignore um, this guy, which is pretty problematic, DTDR? It has the velocity and the opacity. These equations are pretty simple. Well, this one. Camera isn't on. Hmm. Better. I guess they just updated or something. here, the row over here. And then if we take the derivative, So this is what we had before. Which is equal to the four pi. This is a function just of the pressure and the density. And also, 
this is a Poisson's equation. So it's a second order differential equation. Have you seen the Poisson equation somewhere else? Yeah. Where? <laughs> Uh, what about ENM? Okay, so hopefully you'll get to this one. So it's a pretty, a pretty common um, equation in physics. So if we can find a relationship between the density and the pressure, then we wouldn't need to worry about the temperature uh, gradient. So let's put that in the back burner. Consider now the first law of thermodynamics. So du. equal to partial derivative of the heat with respect to the temperature, dt, and this can be constant pressure, constant pressure, and number of particles, minus P, partial derivative of the volume with respect to the temperature, also at constant pressure and number of particles, dt. Right, so we're just rewriting that. And um, this guy over here. What is it? Sorry, not with the PT. Just this guy. The partial derivative of the heat with respect to temperature at constant pressure. And that is CP, the heat capacity at constant pressure. So we can put that in there. That is the definition, or comes from the definition of um, constant pressure heat capacity. So now, for an ideal gas, we know that actually. Well, we, we know where this came from, so we need more space. We know that the pressure times the volume is equal to the number of particles, Boltzmann's constant, and the temperature. So if we take the total derivative of this, we get PDD as PDP equals NKDDT plus 
N T sorry um, K B T B N. So for constant uh, pressure. And also, um, number of particles. Dp and dn equals zero. So we get Ptb equals N KB ET. We can move this one over here. DT. And so P DBDT is just that constant. So we have du dt is going to be equal to definition of the capacity at constant volume to have the U instead of the uh, Q. So that is the Q. So this one is the heat capacity. So and we can get rid of well, CP over DT. We can get rid of all the DTs. And we get this relationship. So that one um, is well known. We can rewrite it CP minus CB equals NKB. Does it make sense that the CP? Uh, heat capacity at constant pressure is larger than the heat capacity at constant volume. What is the difference between DP and CV? 
So let's say that you're doing some calorimetry. So you can measure very accurately the temperature in your sample. And you have a resistor, so you know how much energy you're putting in there. Um, and you get you know, a relationship between that energy that you're putting in and the change in temperature. Is that CP or CV? You're doing it in the atmosphere, so here. What's going to happen when you put heat into the sample? It will expand. So is, if, is that uh, expansion going to help or hinder the uh, amount of heat that it can take per unit temperature? Or if it can expand, you can put more heat in there and the temperature will not increase as much. So heat capacity at constant volume is actually pretty difficult to do because you have to keep the volume of whatever sample you're, you have in there. So CP is typically greater than CV. And there is And that difference, you know, can be quantified. So if we divide this one by CV, this one, and this is just CP over CV minus one. So we can move this one over here. And we get CP over CV. So that's the ratio between the two um, types of heat capacity. So this guy over here, In a lot of, oops, uh, you will see it as um, small gamma, lowercase gamma. But um, Weinberg calls it capital gamma. But this is the gamma that we have been using like everywhere. So it's actually just the, the ratio um, of the heat capacities. Um, this guy, or the gamma, called the adiabatic index. Which problem? CMS? Uh, no, VRMS. What is VRMS? Uh, it was that, like the distribution of velocity, the minimum velocity. Oh. Am I saying the wrong? <laughs> Let me pull it up in the um, You know, I wouldn't be surprised because this arises like in many places, but I don't remember. All right, so now we're going to do something similar.
And this is going to be um, du equals minus pdv. And this is the first law for a gas that is or anything really that is expanding um adiabatically. I guess it will be some sort of fluid typically. So what does it mean that the gas is expanding adiabatically? What does adiabatic mean? Say that again? So this it is doing work on the environment for sure. Um, adiabatically means that there is no um, there's no heat exchange. There's no heat going in and out or out. So the dq here is zero. And so we just have this um, expansion. So all the work that is done on the environment comes from uh, changing the uh, internal energy of the gas. So in this case, We have the same one, so P V and P V P So for constant pressure and constant number of particles we have goes to zero on this one. The PDB falls in in BPT. Now from the definition of the heat capacity, which is DU DT, we get that DT is um, du divided by the heat capacity at constant volume. And which is equal to minus PDV. So, if we put it in the total derivative, get that one, and so. with a little bit of algebra, we get uh, VDP equals minus PDV times NKB over CV plus one. And we know that this is just the um, adiabatic index. So we can put it in there. Okay, so just to refresh your memory.
can say this is DP. Over P minus gamma dv over b. We can integrate on both sides to get natural log of the pressure minus gamma natural log of the volume plus some constant and from there you can get to let's pick a few steps there. Together, the natural log we take it to the exponent. We we'll get PV to the gamma it equals e to the k, which is still a constant. So let's call it k Yeah, let's just call it K, sorry. I was thinking about putting a prime or something, but that's bad. So, this is the adiabatic uh, gas law. And so, pressure, times the volume to the sum power to the power gamma equals uh, the constant. Okay. So, of the what? So you can put them together. It'll be ln of P Equals k, and then e to this, and then e to this. But so I should have called this something else. Maybe uh, I don't know. Not enough letters. But typically. Um, this one you see it and with a K, like in textbooks, uh, PV to the gamma. But you know, typically you will see the uh, lower case gamma. But it's the same. Okay, so that means that the pressure is K. One over the volume to the gamma, and you know all the end that we had in the equations um, gives you like a specific volume. So this is a volume per particle. So this is k rho. Um, to the gamma. So this is the relationship that we were looking for between the pressure and the density. This is Weinberg 1.8.1. All right, so now we're going to put this relationship in the uh, Poisson equation so it was 1 over 
Ours is cleared. DPR R squared over the row, which is a function of R. DPR um, So instead of the pressure, we're going to put the K rho and it's a function of uh, the radius. And that's equal to 4 pi um, G M. Uh, which is a function of the radius. And we have gotten rid of the end. We have the 4G row. Well, we didn't get rid of the, the mass. We just moved it over here with the uh, derivative of the mass with respect to the radius. Okay. So, I have to go to um, book of uh, integrals and derivatives on this one. So the gamma is not changing with respect, it's a constant. So this whole term is zero. So we can rewrite this one as this. So let's make a look. So the K, we can take it out of the way. It's gonna be gamma rho of gamma minus one. B rho which is a function of R, dr, that is equal to 4 pi g rho r. And so we can simplify this a little bit further. We have the gamma over here and this gamma, which is a function of R. So we can rewrite this whole part as r squared rho uh, to the gamma minus two. It's a function of r. Then everything else stays the same. Um, We're missing a gamma that was over here. So you can take the that that gamma out also. And so this is starting to look not as horrible. So this is a second order differential equation. You can solve it if you have a few boundary conditions, you can solve it um, uniquely. So the boundary conditions are that you have a value for the density 
at the center of the sphere. Something. So when you are using these machinery, uh, then you can, this is a parameter that you can adjust, you can fit. Uh, but also, we have a relationship between the density and the pressure, and we had defined before a minimum value for the pressure at the center. So here we can, we can guesstimate what this value is going to be. The other one is um, This is the relationship that we had for the pressure. So, and we can use the same derivative that I had over there before to get K uh, gamma rho gamma minus one, which is the function of law. D rho, yeah. And we know that dpdr is to the minus g m, which is a function of r, rho, which is a function of r, over r squared. So, If we evaluate this one at zero, so you have this R squared over here, which is uh, um, kind of bad, but you can just do L'Hopital. And so the only thing that is going to matter is the mass. So it's not going to be infinite. It's going to be um, oh, M of R. So what is the mass at zero? Yeah. Yeah. So I the mass at the center is zero, right? As you start moving, then you have some finite mass. Uh, so then this whole thing, um, this one is zero. That is a boundary condition. So you want the density to be finite at the center and its change uh, with respect to the radius to be zero. So all your solutions are going to look Um, this is the uh, density. You verify the density at the center. So all of them have to look a little bit like that. They cannot go up, they cannot go um, straight down. 
So let's copy the radius of the star or the body. Um, is this possible to have uh, the uh, density to be constant and then to go to zero? Yeah, that pretty much describes like the Earth, like rocky planets. Um, maybe it goes down a little or there are a few details. You can approximate it as you just constant and then zero. Um, and then we'll see that for gamma equals three fifths, it looks a little bit like this. And then for gamma equals four thirds, it's going to look um, more like this. And well, we'll see. This is part of the uh, homework problem. But as this gamma increases, you're going to have more of the matter close to the center and less further away. Okay. So we have a differential equation. Um, second order, and we have two binary conditions. So we're going to define this guy. This is um, capital theta and it's rho over r rho. Rho of r over rho of zero to the gamma minus one. And using these gamma, you can rewrite the, uh, the differential equation as one over r squared dr r squared square derivative with respect to the radius of omega, which um, will be a function of the radius. And that is 4 pi g gamma minus one over k gamma rho at zero to the two minus gamma and then the capital theta one over gamma minus one. And then you can put another parameter in there. Well, like another definition. So psi is four pi g gamma minus one over k gamma the one half row at the center, which remember is just the value.
R. So you have a bunch of constants, which is this R over here. So then that differential equation is going to look Now the, uh, the theta, which was a function of the radius, now is a function of time. This is you know just the port I all that stuff that was on the other side and there was here. Positive. And this is equation 1.8.5 in Weinberg. It's called the lane um, and so for about hundred years uh, this was the the only equation that astronomers had to describe um, stars. But it's it's pretty powerful because uh, it doesn't depend uh, at least directly on the temperature. It only depends on the density at the center and um, where this one are. Hmm? The H? Oh, this is capital Omega. Uh, I was rho over R, or rho over Omega. The numbers. So you are. First, normalizing this density because this is a constant. So you do first normalize the density, and then you normalize by the by the distance. So it is the same equation, but it's more um, it's more appealing. Okay, so then the boundary conditions are omega at zero equals one from the definition of omega and Omega prime at zero equals zero. So it doesn't go directly down or up. It has to go, has to start constant. So K and rho at zero are the parameters that you can fit to your star. And usually, 
if for historical reasons um, they use n. So gamma equals n plus one over n. So if you use n instead of gamma, becomes just n. Okay, this n should be over here. It's a function. So that n is called the polytropic index. So, for an ideal gas, gamma is three fifths. So, N equals one half. So the polytropic index that describes a star made of an ideal gas is the exponent 1.5. Everything else remains the same. And then for for pure radiation. Gamma was uh, four thirds, so n equals three. So the equation is the same. You have a three over here uh, for the exponent. So the gamma equals two point five. I mean uh, three over five. N equals one point five. Describes gas giants um, white dwarfs that have a low mass and stars that are um, convective so you know the ones that are closer to being like an actual ideal gas and the four thirds describes um, like giants like really massive stars, and also uh, massive white dwarfs. And they can also describe uh, neutron stars. We will see that later. So, there are three values of n, or gamma, for which you can get an analytical solution to this equation. Those values are, uh, well, gamma equals, but I don't get lost in the, So for gamma equals infinity, two, and six fifths. So there is no analytical solution for the pure ideal gas or pure radiation. But you can find numerical solutions.
So let's check out this value. Uh, infinity, which means n equals zero. So if this equals, if gamma is infinity, what is this whole thing? So this is going to be what okay, is just going to be the one about. So plus one equals. So we can move the one over here, minus one. We can put we can move this one over here. It's gonna be and we can also move the B side. On both sides, and this D, and over here we get minus psi over cube over three plus some constant. Now we can move these side squared over here. And this goes away with this one. And so this is minus psi over three. And then we can apply the first boundary condition, we know that this one has to be zero. So zero. Zero, evaluated at zero. It had to be zero. So zero equals zero plus b over psi squared. So c has to be equal to zero. We can forget about it. Now we can move this one over here. Integrate over here. So we get rid of this one. And this one is going to be minus one third psi squared over two plus another integration constant. So here we can apply the second boundary condition. So 
So sine zero has to be um, some value. And because this one was rho oops, r over rho zero is equal to one. So one equals D. So this is a six. So if we want to find the root, so where it touches the zero. I'm sorry, well, where this is equal to zero. Let's call that psi one. get that psi one is square root of six. Okay, so we solve one case. The other cases, as you may imagine, are not difficult. So this table, you can find it in Weinberg, page 62. So for gamma equals uh, infinity, the one we just did, psi one is square root of six. And this one is going to be two square root of six, and the index is zero. And there are a few other ones. So this one we can solve it analytically. So psi one is pi, this one is also pi. The index is one. The one that we care about, five thirds. So this one you have to solve numerically. This is 2.65, this is 2.71, and the index is 1.5. Four thirds we also care about. So again, you have to solve it analytically. I mean, uh, numerically. That's the index three. And the other one that you can solve analytically is six fifths. So over here, psi one is infinity. This guy is square root of three, and the index is five. So I'm putting all of these values in here because um, it turns out that because you have the density um, and this is, it's, it's a parameter, but it tells you where uh, the function is zero. So that essentially tells you where the sphere, the sphere ends in parameter, um, in terms of, of this parameter. So R 
means four pi g gamma minus one over k gamma to the minus one half um, rho zero. So that's here at the center. Uh, minus two. Um, minus gamma over two. Psi one. Then for the mass, we also have the other stuff in there. Uh, but that one is proportional to psi one squared times um, omega. Okay, so radius is proportional to psi one. Mass is proportional to psi one squared times this. So let's look at these cases. What um, star is going to be smaller? One that is closer to being pure radiation or one that is an ideal gas? Sorry, can you mm -hmm. given the same um, density at the center. Yes. So the massive stars that are gonna be, that are closer to being uh, uh, closer to the radiation stability are going to be bigger than the ones that are just ideal gases. What about the mass? For a given radius, actually, these are going to be more massive. The, uh, the ones that are an ideal gas. What does this one mean? The one that has psi one equals um, infinity. Hmm? Why would it be a cloud? So this is. Uh, yeah, it, it reaches its um, radius at infinity. So this is, you know, kind of the size of the universe. So in reality, you can describe galaxies with, uh, with this one. So yeah, they are, they are diffuse. Um, and what about this one, the one that we solved? So the index is zero. This is a little bit more difficult to understand in terms of the difference in the heat capacities. Remember that this is the difference in the heat capacities. Uh, but this is your rocky planet that has constant, um, constant density. So, it's mean, pretty close. I mean, by star standards, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess what I'm thinking is like the asteroid is probably even better. Mm -hmm. 
although it needs to have enough mass, I think, that it will become a, a sphere. Yeah. yeah, because most asteroids, they have like regular shapes because they don't have enough gravity. But yeah, and that would be pretty low density, but pretty constant. So this is, a, you know, even though it leaves out a lot of the complexity, especially coming from the, the, the change in the temperature with respect to the radius, it's a, it's a very powerful model. Like it allows you to understand a lot of, uh, of phenomena really in the universe. So from rock planets to uh, to galaxies. And it's just based on the assumption that there is a relationship, a non-complicated relationship between the pressure and the density. Okay, so this, yeah, the R and the M's come from integrating the solutions. That is, that's what I have for you today. So questions, comments? No? So when are you going to meet for, or, or did you already meet for that, that discussion? Uh, I saw something back today. We're going to meet at are you going to meet in person or no? No, it will be uh, in person. Mm -hmm. What do we do though? Do you like record it or? Yeah, like yeah, if you can record, record something at the end, you know, like we don't did the with a summary of the discussion, that would be best, I think. Whatever you need. I wrong, yeah, hopefully less than like an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go that long. <laughs> Even though I think uh, like... <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good paper. Uh, it's about a uh, one about uh, nucleus synthesis, right? What I'm more glad about on the paper is the fact that it's also easy to read too. Um, unlike this thing. Okay, I want to show you uh, this SPS shirt at a time. Well, not really me. No, well, I, I sent the concept to my friend. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the light curtain around the mass box. Maybe, yeah, it's got to be explained. <laughs> it looks a little bit like the drawings on the no, the, the golden record. <laughs> yeah, well, it is the same one. I think, like, no. they have that there. They, no. have, they don't have something bending. They don't have light bending. Are you sure? I'm a pulsar. They have pulsars. They have a map of the pulsars. All right, so questions over here? If not, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>